the equality of all people. And I'm certainly glad that they do. I wish everyone would not only affirm but protect human dignity no matter who they are or what they believe. But have you ever stopped to consider where this dignity comes from or how we know that we actually have it? Take the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights as an example. Article 1 states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Hopefully every single one of us could affirm that statement. But take a moment to consider this. The Declaration assumes that there's something about human beings that not only gives us dignity, but equal dignity. Yet the Declaration never tries to explain what this dignity is or how we can be sure that we really have it. This has led at least two different Christian philosophers who taught at Yale, Nicholas Wilberstorff and John Hare, to argue that there is in fact no secular basis for human rights. That's not to suggest that you have to be a Christian or a religious person to affirm human rights or to defend human rights. We know that's not true. Anyone can fight for human rights. The point is simply that there's no secular rationale for believing that human rights are grounded in reality. So how do secular people deal with this issue? Wolterstorff would say that the closest a secular person can get to an explanation for human rights would be called a capacities-based argument for human dignity. These people would say that human beings have dignity because of what we are capable of doing. Most often they would cite our capacity for reason or self-awareness. Human beings have equal dignity because we possess the capacity for reason and self-awareness. But there's one little problem with that argument. Not every human being has that capacity. This argument for human dignity covers most people, but not all. It doesn't cover some of the most vulnerable members at the margins of our society, like the unborn, the infant, the mentally handicapped, the person in a permanent coma, or the person suffering from Alzheimer's. Now you might say, well, that's okay. We don't need to worry about that because those on the margins are never going to be treated as less than human. But I'm not so sure that that's true. Take Peter Singer as an example. He's an ethicist who teaches at Princeton. Peter Singer would argue that all persons should be treated according to moral guidelines. But here's the catch. Singer explicitly states that not all human beings are persons. In order to be considered a person, in his view, you must possess self-awareness. If you do not possess self-awareness, then you do not count as a person. And the same moral laws do not apply. Therefore, he would say that those who suffer from significant cognitive disabilities or even those who suffer from chronic illnesses are less valuable than those who are not disabled. And in some cases, he would say, it might be appropriate to kill them if it would be better for the non-disabled people around them. We know instinctively in our bones there's something wrong with them. And that is why this is so important. We need some kind of basis for human dignity and human rights that is not grounded in our capacities. And you can't get that from a secular view of the world. There's no secular basis for human rights. So where did we get this idea that every human being has equal dignity and that we all have a responsibility to defend the most vulnerable members of our society? It came from the Bible. The scriptures teach that every single human being without exception is created in the image of God, loved by God, and called to love God in response. As a result, every human being is imbued with infinite value and possesses an inherent right to be treated in accordance with his or her worth. It's a good thing that there are so many people who care about human rights, but if we want to uphold the dignity of every human being without exception, then we need to remember where that worth comes from and why it can never be taken away. I'd love to hear from you, and in fact, that'd be a great help to me. I want to know what's on your mind. So if you have questions or comments about what I've shared, or if there are other topics you'd like me to address, leave a comment below or send me an email at seniorpastor at centralchurchnyc.org. Thanks for watching.
Many people, regardless of whether they subscribe to any particular set of religious beliefs or not, would say that they're committed to universal human rights and the equality of all people. And I'm certainly glad that they do. I wish everyone would not only affirm but protect human dignity no matter who they are or what they believe. Many people, regardless of whether they subscribe to any particular set of religious beliefs or not, would say that they're committed to universal human rights and the equality of all people. And I'm certainly glad that they do. I wish everyone would not only affirm but protect human dignity no matter who they are or what they believe. But have you ever stopped to consider where this dignity comes from or how we know that we actually have it? Take the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights as an example. Article 1 states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Hopefully every single one of us could affirm that statement. But take a moment to consider this. The Declaration assumes that there's something about human beings that not only gives us dignity, but equal dignity. Yet the Declaration never tries to explain what this dignity is or how we can be sure that we really have it. This has led at least two different Christian philosophers who taught at Yale, Nicholas Wolterstorff and John Hare, to argue that there is in fact no secular basis for human rights. That's not to suggest that you have to be a Christian or a religious person to affirm human rights or to defend human rights. We know that's not true. Anyone can fight for human rights. The point is simply that there's no secular rationale for believing that human rights are grounded in reality. So how do secular people deal with this issue? Wolterstorff would say that the closest a secular person can get to an explanation for human rights would be called a capacities-based argument for human dignity. These people would say that human beings have dignity because of what we are capable of doing. Most often they would cite our capacity for reason or self-awareness. Human beings have equal dignity because we possess the capacity for reason and self-awareness. But there's one little problem with that argument. Not every human being has that capacity. This argument for human dignity covers most people, but not all. It doesn't cover some of the most vulnerable members at the margins of our society, like the unborn, the infant, the mentally handicapped, the person in a permanent coma, or the person suffering from Alzheimer's. Now you might say, well, that's okay. We don't need to worry about that because those on the margins are never going to be treated as less than human. But I'm not so sure that that's true. Take Peter Singer as an example. He's an ethicist who teaches at Princeton. Peter Singer would argue that all persons should be treated according to moral guidelines. But here's the catch. Singer explicitly states that not all human beings are persons. In order to be considered a person in his view, you must possess self-awareness. If you do not possess self-awareness, then you do not count as a person. And the same moral laws do not apply. Therefore, he would say that those who suffer from significant cognitive disabilities or even those who suffer from chronic illnesses are less valuable than those who are not disabled. And in some cases,
morning and welcome to Central. My name is Chris. It is a joy and a delight to have you all here with us. We are a church for the convinced as well as the unconvinced. So whether you're actively committed to the Christian faith, uh, unsure of your spiritual commitments, or simply curious, uh, it is our privilege to have you here with us this morning. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. On the back of our bulletin is a tear-off sheet. Uh, especially if you are a first or second time visitor, you'd like to know more information about the church or get connected, you can fill out that form, tear it off and give it to one of the ushers or put it in the offering plate when it comes around. Uh, this morning we have a very special guest, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Scott Redd is here uh, to preach for us. Uh, Scott is the president of uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. He's also the professor of Old Testament uh, there as well. And he and his wife, Jen, are the parents of five daughters, so he is full of wisdom and patience and love. Uh, I've known Scott for, I think, uh, about 20 years now, maybe a little bit over 20 years. We were talking last night, and I have a vague recollection that he was my teach uh, the teaching assistant for my uh, first semester Greek class. He doesn't want to have uh, anything to do with that because my Greek is, I don't know how you say rusty in Koine Greek, uh, but it is that, and it's not great. But Scott's a, a, a dear friend, a great teacher, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of this church, uh, and we are delighted to have him uh, with us. God calls us into worship. Uh, we're going to use the call to worship from Isaiah 55, where the prophet Isaiah invites Israel, and therefore we are now invited into God's presence uh, to incline our ear, to give our fullest, uh, very parts of ourselves to God, the one who invites us and uh, lavishes us with his grace and mercy. So let's call one another into worship. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And the one who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and with price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Let's sing together. join our voices together in the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. You may be seated. The call to worship from Isaiah 55 was an invitation to us to come and incline our ears, to give our fullest uh, parts of ourselves to God who loves us and calls us to himself. And when we gather into worship, we must also uh, be honest about the reality that so oftentimes we accept other invitations. We hear other calls from other gods, lesser gods, who are inviting us to feasts that we ought not uh, be at, feasts that do not give life, feasts that do not call us uh, to the one who has created us and redeemed us. And so that's why when we gather for worship, we confess our sins and we hear God's words of assurance and that invitation once again to enter into his presence. So we're going to confess our sins first using the confession that's found in your bulletin, and then we'll take a moment for a personal private confession. So let's confess our sins together. Lord God, we have given more weight to our successes and our happiness than to your will. We have eaten without a thought for the hungry. We have spoken without an effort to understand others. We have kept silence instead of telling the truth. We have judged others, forgetful that you alone are the judge. We have acted in accordance with your opinions rather than according to your commands. Within your church, we have been slow to practice love of our neighbors. And in the world, we have not been your faithful servants. Forgive us and help us to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Now, friends, hear these words of assurance from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. So friends, hear and receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let me invite you to stand. We have peace with God. We also have peace with one another. So the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let's take a moment to pass Christ's peace to one another.
Join our voices with Christians around the world and throughout the ages who have professed our faith in the living God using the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Children are always welcome to stay with, with us for the worship service, but they can also go upstairs to Children's Church on the seventh floor. And before we send them off, we're going to pray for them. So you can join me up here. There's a lot of excitement in the kiddos this morning. Good morning. Oh, look at all. All right, come on up. Have a seat. Get cozy. Yeah, sit right in there. Is everybody here? Are we ready? You guys ready? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day which you have made. We thank you for all the many blessings that you have given us. We pray for these children, that you would open their ears, that you, they would hear your word and your truth and know that you speak to them in love. You would open their eyes so they could see all the ways of your work. Uh, in their lives, in our world, and you would stir their hearts, that they would follow you and love you and know that you love them with a love that never spoils, it never fades away, it never grows dim, not because of anything they've done, but because of your love for them that you show in and through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Good job. The promise we are given when we gather for worship is that God loves to hear the prayers of his people. He bends his ear towards us and he invites us to offer our needs, our praises, uh, our petitions, uh, not just for ourselves, but for our city and for our world. And so with that, we're going to uh, pray to God. So would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you have given us. In you, we live and we move and we have our being. You are the one who so richly blesses us beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. And we ask this day that you would help us to find hope in the cross, find hope in the resurrection, especially during difficult trials, 
and temptations. Help us to hear your word, to delight in your truth, to trust in the promises that you have made to us. Be for us our ultimate counsel and strength in our times of weakness and in our times of struggle. Lord Jesus, you are the long-awaited, the long-promised Son of God, the Son of Man. So look with compassion on your wounded world. Make war and oppression and famine cease. Bring an end to the conflict in Ukraine. Stamp down all oppressors. And where there are brewing conflicts, bring peace. Draw especially near to your people in places where they are isolated and persecuted. For those who worship and gather this day in secret for fear of retribution, for those who must whisper your name for fear of death, bring peace and bring courage. And multiply your numbers as you've done among the persecuted church all throughout her history. Holy Spirit, you are the great comforter and counselor, and so we pray for those in this city who are suffering. Bring them comfort in their time of need and rouse your church to love the lonely, care for the distressed, and proclaim your beautiful church, your beautiful truth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, guide us and sustain us this day as we pray all these things. Amen. At this time, as I invite the ushers to come forward to receive an offering, this is an opportunity for friends and members and regular attenders to support the ministry and mission of Central. Uh, if you're visiting, we don't want you to feel under any obligation to give, but if Central is your church home, then consider the ways that God has so richly uh, blessed you and how you might offer yourselves back to him.
Please be seated. Good morning. It is good to be with you. It's good to be with old friends. Chris and Jeannie and my wife Jen and I got to have dinner last night and catch up and it's good to, it's, it's such a blessing, as you all know, to see how friends grow in the Christian life and do things and how the Lord calls us and uses us. It is especially wonderful to be here with this congregation that the Lord is using so mightily here in the city. Specifically, I'd I'd just like to say thank you before I get going. Thank you for the continued partnership that you have had with our seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary in New York City. Um, I can tell you as someone who has a very similar relationship with the church down in Washington, D.C. We, we can't do what we do. We can't train up pastors and other church leaders, counselors, and missionaries without churches like Central Church coming alongside us and making it possible for us to do this, particularly in these urban centers like New York and Washington. It's just such a gift to be with you all this morning. Now, our reading comes out of Psalm 119, and as you know, this is kind of the Moby Dick of the Psalter. This is the big one. 176 verses. It's divided up into 22 stanzas, all built around the Hebrew alphabet. We're actually in the fifth stanza, for those of you who are interested. So this is the uh, hey stanza. Hey is the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. And so we're in the hey stanza, and it's in this part of the poem that the, the poet is stopping for a moment, he's reflecting on a particular aspect of God's Word. What he's saying specifically here is how much he yearns for God's Word. And because this is Hebrew poetry, the way it works is that you say a similar thing over and over again to kind of get into every different aspect of the thing. So notice that as we read verses 33 to 40, notice how the psalmist is saying a specific thing but in slightly different ways to kind of get all the way around into every nook and cranny of the idea that he's trying to express, particularly here his yearning for the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 33 to 40 says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my ear to your testimonies, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things, and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, that you may be feared. Turn away the approach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, and your righteousness give me life. Let's pray. Our Lord, as we come to you this Sunday morning, I pray that you would bless us, that you'd have mercy upon us. We give thanks, Lord, that as we've prayed and sung already, you receive us as those who have been washed in the blood. You receive us as as righteous and as beloved as your Son himself, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that as we hear your word, I pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts that appreciate it for what it is, minds that can understand what it has to say to us, and mouths that can respond in the only way that's appropriate, its response of praise and worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, actions speak louder than words. That's what the article said. 
It was about a politician who had gotten into office running on an anti-corruption platform, and yet he was, of course, found to be taking bribes. One voter in his district was interviewed about the politician's recent troubles, and he said, actions speak louder than words. It's a cliche, I know. I come from Washington, D.C. We're, we're, we're a city of words. We talk a lot about the fact that actions speak louder than words. Why is that? Why do we say that? Why is it such a common phrase that if I say actions speak, you know how to end the phrase louder than words? Why is that? Because this saying is really kind of a comment, isn't it? It's a comment on the human capacity to use words, to use our mouths to deceive. I'm not talking about open lies either. I'm just talking about the way we talk. We often speak and say things that we do not mean just to accomplish some kind of particular end. Think about it. How, how many times have you said something just so that you can get somebody off your back? Yeah. Yeah. How many times have you carefully worded a response so that you can avoid further conflict in the future or maybe even just further conversation? How often have you found yourself in a situation in which you'll say anything to escape? You know, words are great escape hatches. All you need to say is something like this. Hey, it, it, was, it was really great to see you, but I've I got to get going. Even though it wasn't great to see them and you've got nowhere to go. <laughs> right? or, or, or the common one around my town is this. Hey, let's, let's do lunch. Come on, let's go. Hey, let's do lunch sometime. It's a great way of getting out of a conversation, right? As a matter of fact, many of our international students at RTS will comment on the fact that one of the first things they have to learn when they move to the United States is that when people say, let's do lunch, don't pull out your calendar. They don't really want to plan lunch. It's a way of moving on. But you see, actions are different. Actions require commitment. They require effort. They require preparation and foresight. They require sacrifice. You have to think about the other person. You have to anticipate their needs. You have to take action and take responsibility for those actions. Imagine how well a marriage or even a friendship would work if the only way you showed affection was with words. You just said, I love you. You, know, you tell your spouse, I love you. I, I, just, I just love you. I love you. I love you so much. But there's no dinners out. There's no hugs. There's no kisses. There's no touch. There's no caress. Sooner or later, probably, the relationship is going to self-destruct. You see, our love, our friendships, all of our meaningful human relationships need to be nurtured by actions as well as words. That's how human words work. But that's not how God's words work. That's how human words work. It's not how God's words work. God's words are different. We don't treat God's words like human words. We don't discount them. We don't, we don't kind of set them aside. We don't take them with a grain of salt because his words are fundamentally different than our words. That's what I love about Psalm 119, this, this great Moby Dick of the Psalter. It's a long extended poem. It's a meditation on the word of the Lord. That's actually probably why it's organized around the alphabet. You see, how he's, see, you see what he's doing there? He's saying... God's word, and then he's organizing the poem around the building blocks of words, right? God's word is something to be treasured, to be held close, to be yearned for, and to be meditated upon. As a matter of fact, even in the passage that we're looking at here, the psalmist is using multiple different words to talk about what he means by God's word. Notice that he, he uses the word in verse 34 of the law. Right? This is that Hebrew word Torah, right? the law. And that, and that can mean the Ten Commandments. Sometimes people even use that today to mean the Ten Commandments. Or, or maybe just the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Or maybe, as the Apostle Paul uses it, he uses it to talk about the whole of the Old Testament. He calls it the Torah. But no matter how you look at it, it's, it's used in syn you know, synonymously with these multiple different words that are basically talking about what we now call God's special revelation, his word to us. 
Notice you see a bunch of synonyms in this passage. He says Torah in verse 34, rules in verse 39, testimonies in verse 36, commandments, verse 35, statutes, verse 33, precepts, verse 40, promise, verse 38. I don't think he's talking about multiple different things here. He's all talking about how God reveals himself to us through the power of his word. They're all used interchangeably, and it's not just in this stanza, it's throughout the whole poem. And I think one thing that we can say about it is that the psalmist is very enamored with God's words. He's enamored with what God has to say, how he instructs, what he commands, the ways that he testifies about himself. It's nothing short of an infatuation. Notice, by the way, we wouldn't talk this way about human words, would we? We don't talk the way that he talks about God's words. We wouldn't talk that way about human words. Would you ever go to someone and say, teach me your statutes so that I may keep them to the end? Or give me understanding that I may keep your commands to me, your law, and observe it with my whole heart. We'd see there, we think there's something wrong. You, You shouldn't treat human words this way. And yet the psalmist thinks it's entirely appropriate to treat God's words this way. So why? That's, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Why, why does the psalmist respond to God's word with this kind of infatuation, this, this enamoring? Why, why is he so in love and yearning for God's word? I'm going to argue it's because God's word is true, it's because it's powerful, and because it's present. Okay, it's a Presbyterian church after all. I need three points. Okay, So true, powerful, and present. Notice I didn't find a word like perfect, powerful, and present. I didn't do three Ps. I did true. Okay, so I'm keeping, it's kind of consistent here. All right, so notice, true, powerful, and present. Let's start with the first point here. I want to talk about how God's word is true. And not only is it true, it's true in an authoritative way. In other words, it has, it has a say over us. God's word is true because God is true. Moses tells us in Numbers 23, God is not a man. Notice he's saying the same thing that we've been talking about. God is not a man that he lies. Okay, God's word are not like human words and that they can deceive. Notice the author of Hebrews doubles down on this. He says it's impossible. This is Hebrews 6 verse 18. It's impossible for God to lie. Why? He's not constrained by it. You might say, well, this is, this is, you know, he's almighty. Can't he do all things? No, no, he's not constrained by lying. It's that he is positively the God of truth. It's impossible for him to lie. That's not his M.O. It's not who he is. And this truth gives God's word an authority that no other author can claim. Notice that in Psalm 119, verse 33, there's an assumption of the truth and the authority of God's word. Notice he doesn't say, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and then I'll consider them in light of what I know from my own insights, and I'll mull it over and find the useful tidbits that I can apply to my life. What does he say? Teach me your statutes, and I will keep them to the end. The assumption is that God's words are true. Verse 34, give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. I remember when I was five years old, I was driving with my grandparents through the countryside. They had a house down in the Outer Banks, and we were driving back up to Virginia Beach. If you've ever done that drive, you know you go through a lot of fields and stuff, and we were on a wide open country road, and and I wiggled out of my backseat seatbelt and I got up on my knees and I, I rolled down the window because it was just so beautiful outside and I just stuck my whole face out the window. I was, I was really hanging out the window and I remember my grandfather yelling back and I could barely hear him over the wind and he said, Scotty, Scotty, get back in, get, get, get your seatbelt on, that's not safe. And I had a brilliant response. I said, I said, Grandpa, I don't have to listen to you. You're not my dad. Okay? I, I found out later, to my chagrin, that my father didn't share that same sentiment. You see, in Psalm 119, there's no question about the authority, right? 
of God's words, the merits of God's words. The question is not, should I keep your statutes? Are you my dad? It's not that. It's how can I keep your statutes? How do I get the ability to keep your statutes? See, the value and the authority is assumed. And that's the foundation of the whole psalm. God's word is not lacking. It's the psalmist who's lacking. He's the one who needs God's word. God's word doesn't need him. So the first thing I want to point out is why do we yearn for God's word? Because it's true. It's perfect. It's good. Second, it's powerful. God's word is powerful. It, 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 God's words speak louder than actions, at least louder than our actions, because God's word is action. God's word does stuff. I know, I know human language can do stuff too. We can hurt with our words. We can even do things like say, you know, I, I hereby pronounce you man and wife. And by pronouncing that, right, when you say that, what are you doing? You're doing a thing. I can say, I christen the, you know, the, you know, the Titanic, right? I'm, by saying it, I'm doing it. But we're not talking about that with God's words. God's words actually accomplish actions in the world around them. It never returns void. Think about when God creates the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say that he sat down and kind of molded things together with his hands. What does he say? He said, let there be light. And there's light. Let the waters be separated, and they're separated. You see, when God does stuff, he does it through his word. And the power of God's word is not a tame power. It's not a magic that we can manipulate and control by some kind of ritual. We can't make God do what we want. He's not our vending machine God. And for this reason, when God's word is on display, when we see the power of it, the response is not often, well, there, finally I got the thing I wanted. The response is usually one of fear. Notice verse 38, confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. It might sound odd to us. We think, no, if God's word does what it's supposed to do, then I should be happy, I should be relieved. And yet we have to acknowledge that as creatures before the Creator, when we are confronted with the power of our God's Word, the response is often fear. Now think about the story of the disciples when they're in the boat. It's, it's told both in Luke chapter 6 and Mark chapter 5. When they're in the boat with Jesus and there's a storm that rises up and the waves are coming over and the, and the boat's about to flood and the disciples go to Jesus who's sleeping in the back of the boat and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're about to die? Don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus stands up without a word to them, walks up to the front of the boat. And what does he do? He says, peace, be still. And what do the wind and the waves do? They go, whew, they quiet out. Notice, by the way, Jesus doesn't say, in the name of the Father in heaven, peace be still. Jesus doesn't have to claim the Father's authority to speak to the wind and the waves. He does it on his own authority. And whenever I read that story, I think the disciples must have been cheered, right? They cheered and they rejoiced and said, how wonderful is Jesus' power on our behalf. But that's not what it says. Here's a, here's a refresher for Chris from Greek. When the storm was coming over the sides of the boats, at least in the Gospel of Mark, when the storm was coming over the side of the boats, it says that they were phobond, right? Pho phobia, right? They had fear. You know what they are after Jesus calms the wind and the waves? They are megaphobon. They are more afraid. You see, the wind and the waves was scary, but they say, who is this who is in the boat with us? So God's word is authoritative and it's true. It's also powerfully, perfectly powerful. It does stuff. It doesn't return void. But thirdly, God's word is with us. It's present. It's here. It's now. It's accessible to us. It's accessible to the psalmist in a way. There's something that's quite startling about Psalm 119 that scholars have noted that as you read the psalmist talking about God's word, he doesn't seem to be talking about a scroll or a book. He says things like this, When I awake, there you are with me, God's word. 
When, when I'm walking along the way in the valley of the shadow of death, that's Psalm 23, of course, but he's talking about being in the valley and, and there's fear and death all around and marauders. He says, you protect me, God's word. It's very personal language. See, in the ancient context, this sort of thing would have been incredibly rare. The, the gods of the ancient world did not walk with you and hold you and carry you and protect you in the night when you wake up with night sweats. Other gods were accessible, but you could only access them through omens. You'd have to gut animals and look at their livers and try to figure out what they were doing or mix liquids together. Everything was external to the worshiper. It wasn't personal. It was very external. And it was a bit haphazard. But the psalmist here directly talks to God. He says, oh Lord, come with your word. Come find me. The whole psalms records this as a very personal encounter, one that anticipates, cries out for, even expects some kind of personal experience with God. Where God's word is, there God is also. You see, it, it was never about a set of rules. It was never about just doing the right stuff. It's about diving into the Word of God and finding Him there and finding abundant life there. Scholars of the Psalms, both Christian and Jewish for that matter, interestingly, will say that here the psalmist is intuiting something about the Word of God, that the Word of God is not a thing, but that it's personal. The Word of God is the presence of God. I think we find this in the gospel writer John when he introduces his gospel with this extended meditation on who Jesus is. And remember how he starts it. This is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was what? The Word. You might think, was he talking about a book? No. The Word was with God. And just to be clear, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. Of course, John's not talking about an abstract word. He's talking about Christ himself. And the word became flesh. You see, Jesus is that part of the equation that the psalmist knows he needs. Jesus is the word among us. He's our teacher. He's our rabbi. He's the one who reveals to us who God is. Without him, we're criti critically and chronically alienated from God himself. However, the opposite is true too, that because of Jesus, because our rabbi has walked with us, because of Christ, we can sing Psalm 119 and we can sing it with confidence. We can sing it with joy, not with tears. We can sing it knowing that we have the word, that he has walked in the way of God's commands and in doing so, he has accomplished for us what the psalmist knows he cannot accomplish for himself. That's why he says, give me the ability to follow your word. We should sing Psalm 119 for ourselves in freedom, knowing that God's word no longer condemns us. It doesn't alienate us from God, but it draws us to him. It helps us meet him there. Like the psalmist, we know that we don't fully keep God's commands, but for those who have thrown in their lot with Jesus, we know that our condemnation for not keeping God's commands is already complete. It was placed on Christ. He wore our guilt for our sakes so that we can engage with God's word without our self-made handcuffs on. Now we're called to pursue God's word in response to Jesus. And we're free to respond to him in thanks. And that raises the question, God's word is true, if it's powerful, if it's present with us in Christ and through his spirit, then how ought we now to engage God's word? And I would say any way that you can. A lot of people struggle with this. They struggle with sitting down with this ancient text written in ancient Semitic times and later in ancient Hellenistic times. They like it in theory, but it's a struggle to do in practice. So I want to end with this. We, we have to acknowledge that it's not always easy to read God's Word. 
that, that, our, that our, our brains have even been changing over the last few decades, making it maybe even harder for us to read God's Word in a way that generations before us might have. It's, it's difficult to have a book with you, a codex, a Bible at all times so that you can open it up. So I would encourage you, in light of Christ, in, Christ, in light of who God's Word is and what it is, that we find whatever means possible to delve into it. Some 15 years ago, so this is a while ago in the whole internet revolution time, Nicholas Carr was writing in the Atlantic Monthly, and he was writing about the fact that uh, you know, neurologists are starting to realize that there's a change happening in our brains as we all get more engaged with online and digital technologies. His article was called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And he concluded with this, I don't know what the change is, but it's something once I was a scuba diver in the sea of words, but now I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet ski. I would encourage you, in whatever way you can engage with God's Word, find it. If the old model that you learned in college isn't working out, find a new model. If the longer passages intimidate you, read shorter sections and focus on them longer. I had one professor in telling me how to keep up with my Hebrew. He said, just do five minutes a day. Don't even set like a verse limit. Just do five minutes. And once you're done with the five minutes, stop and put it down. But stay in it. If you like, your, you know, if you like reading your Bible on your phone, read it on your phone. If you write, like reading a few verses at a time, read a few verses at a time. If you like listening to it, it's interesting. I hear people say, well, people just listen to their Bibles now. They don't read them. You know that for most of human history, that's how you had God's Word. You were listening to it. You were not looking at it. Listen to it. Read it with other people. Read it with your friends in your church. Read it with people who died centuries ago. Yes, our brains are changing, but that does not alleviate our need and our desire for God's Word. Because if what the psalmist is saying is true, then this is how we engage in God's Word, and this is how we find abundant life. As a matter of fact, this is how God changes us. This is how He renews us. Theologians call this the work of sanctification, that is holy making. God makes us holy by our engagement with his word. God makes us into the kind of people who we are in Christ through the renewal that comes through the spirit attending to the word of God. Some Christians believe, well, no, God's involved in my conversion. God is the one who brings me to faith. God is the one who forgives me for my sins. But after that, it's up to me. If you hold that view, you are underestimating God's personal and ongoing work in the life of the believer to make you into the sort of person that God has called you to be. Yes, he does this behind the scenes. There are all those stories. You've heard them. Maybe you've experienced them. You become a Christian and all of a sudden some addiction, some destructive uh, behavior that you had experienced is, is kind of taken away and you just are freed from it. You're relieved of it. Those are wonderful stories. I love hearing about them. They're encouraging to me. But I also don't think, as someone who's involved in the work of the church, I don't think that's how God usually changes us. Yes, he works behind the, sta the, the scenes, but he's also working on the stage of our consciousness. He's working on us, engaging him through his word, prayerfully, in community, in relationship. You see, the fully orbed, spiritually rich, God-centered life is one in which the follower of God is pursuing God by conforming himself and being conformed to the word of God who, yes, is a person. It's worth yearning for because it changes everything. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do lift up this time to you. I pray as we prepare for communion, Lord, as we prepare to come to you in this special way. I pray that you prepare our hearts to be conformed to the word that is the word Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us. Draw us to you, we pray, in the only way, or the way that only you can, which is through the power of the Spirit of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Scott.
God's words speak louder than actions, and the words we hear at this table are take and eat, come and drink. The very invitation we started with at the beginning of our service from Isaiah 55 now comes to culmination. It's fullest and most beautiful form here at this table where our Lord not only speaks to us, but he follows up with actions, broken body, blood outpoured for your sake because he loves us and he cares for us and he's uh, called us together to feed and rest upon him. The one who speaks to us, the one who provides for us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's here at this table that our Lord offers us this bread and this cup to guarantee our share in his death and resurrection, to unite us to himself and to unite us to one another. And, say, and so we take this food gladly, proclaiming that as we do that Jesus Christ is our life and he will one day call us to the great supper of the Lamb. Would you join me in the prayer of thanksgiving that's found on page 12 of your bulletin? Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and joy, that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Amen. Now would you join me in the prayer of humble access. Together, we do not presume to come to this, your table, O Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but solely in your great mercy. We are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord who always delights in showing mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, that we who now receive these gifts of bread and wine, according to our Savior's word, may share in the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, that we may dwell in him forever, and he in us. Amen. And on the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he had dinner with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, this is my body which has been given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, Again, he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which has been shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so the Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. With those who are helping to serve the Lord's Supper, please come forward. And as they do, let me remind you here at Central, we take uh, the Lord's Supper by intinction, so you can come forward uh, take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. Uh, if you're coming through the center aisles, you can go out the side. There are uh, two stations up front. There's a station in the side chapel. There's also two stations in the back. So if you're closer to the back of the sanctuary, you can uh, receive it by going behind you. Uh, there's also uh, communion on the landing for those in the balcony. It is our uh, hope each and every week that among us would be friends and neighbors who are considering the claims of Christianity or, or listening, for her word, listening for God's word and still trying to discern uh, how he might be speaking to us. If that describes you, if you are, for whatever reason, not uh, ready to partake of this supper, we don't want you to feel out of place or awkward at all. We are so glad that you are here. There are prayers in the bulletin for you to read and perhaps even to pray during this time. But if you're resting and receiving upon Christ alone for salvation, if you're yearning for his word and for him to speak to you and uh, pursuing him, trusting in his work in your life, then come to this table. Come and let him feed you and nourish you and come because it's all been prepared.
Friends, thank you for joining us this morning before we receive God's benediction. Just a few quick reminders. Down front to my left, the prayer team uh, will be uh, immediately following the service. So if you have any prayer needs at all, they would love to pray with you and for you. And as is our practice throughout the summer months, uh, our fellowship hour is outside on the sidewalk. So uh, please stick around and join us for that as well. Now lift up your heads and hearts and receive God's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Our Lord gathers us in worship. He also sends us out in mission. So let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.